We have to meet people where they are, and that means helping people with their basic health needs and their basic economic needs. And that's something that I think our community is getting a lot better at, but I think still think we have a long way to go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Skoglen. I'm a partner in our investment banking division in London, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Jennifer Morris, CEO of the Nature Conservancy, here today. We have a number of uh, former and current <laughs> leaders at Goldman Sachs involved with the incredibly important work that TNC is doing every day. And I was asked to join the global board of TNC earlier this year, which made me both incredibly proud and humbled. It's been a steep learning curve. So it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Jennifer here today. Thank you so much, Anna. Great to be here. Thank you. Now, I don't know if anyone has been trying to travel around Midtown uh, this <laughs> week. Um, I had not really sort of understood uh, why actually Jennifer was available this week. Now I know why, because she's been attending Climate Week. So I thought we're gonna start there hot off the press, how have you been spending this week and uh, what have been the sort of key topics that you've been discussing and who have you been meeting? Great. So first and foremost, Anna, thank you for hosting me here today. I'm thrilled to be here. So yes, I am here for Climate Week. This is the UN General Assembly Week where world leaders come to the great uh, island of Manhattan to get together and try to, to solve some of the world's biggest problems. And one of those problems is, of course, climate change. And one of the things that I'm excited about, this is, I think, the fifth or sixth climate week, um, is the fact that nature, the issue that, of course, the Nature Conservancy cares about, is front and center. And it wasn't in the beginning, right? We were talking really focused on energy, 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 which is critically important. But it's actually 70% of the problem of, of climate. If we don't focus on nature, which represents about 30% of total global emissions, we will never get to our 1.5 degree target under the Paris Agreement. So nature is front and center, and it's great to see a lot of world leaders coming together, recognizing that on stage at the, at the UN, but also really in smaller groups with corporations to dig in and to figure out how do we solve these problems. So what were the key topics that you discussed? Yeah, there's been, there's been quite a few. Um, in fact, I just, just now came from a lunch to discuss the emerging area of alternative and, and quote unquote sustainable proteins. So I don't know if you have any of you in the room have had a cell based uh, chicken before, but I just had my first one and so far so good. It actually really tastes like chicken. So this is one of the many, many examples of some of the topics of new technologies, new creative solutions. And, and again, back to that 30% of the problem that we haven't really addressed yet. Technologies are there and they're important, but they're really long-term. Um, we have to focus on the transition in agriculture and food production now, because it is 30% of global emissions. So we could all stop using fossil fuel energy tomorrow. And again, we will not achieve our goals under Paris because agriculture is that, that one area. We all need it, but it's driving 80% of deforestation around the world, which causes significant emissions and uses 70% of our global water production is coming from agriculture. So there's been a lot of discussion around how do we fix ag? What is the next evolution, revolution, if you will, in, in the agriculture space? We had many people in the room at this lunch that I just attended who were you know, around when the renewable energy transition started and everyone said, oh, it can't be done, it's too expensive, there's just no way we're ever gonna be able to compete with the cost of coal. And now here we are, 10, 15 years later, and we are, we know that renewable energy in some places is cost competitive, if not less than some sources of fossil fuels. We don't have that yet in the ag space. And so that's what we're trying to push on. We have a discussion yesterday night at dinner that we are getting questions from clients mm. on you know, how can we invest that? Not necessarily doing it in-house, but supporting companies in their supply chain. Um, my partner, Jennifer Kopolev, who is here, uh, raised this topic. Um, maybe Climate Week, but maybe taking a step back. I know you're an English major. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, yeah, but you were. So what brought you to conservation? 
Yeah, um, well, I was an English liberal arts major, English and poli sci. I went to Emory, um, and when I graduated, um, I, like many people graduating with a liberal arts degree, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I really wanted to travel. So I spent a year living in Japan, teaching English, and then I really realized my dream, which was to live in Africa. And, so, and why was that? Um, I was always just fascinated growing up as a kid. I was fascinated by the culture, was fascinated by the history, um, disturbed by the history, of course, in many respects, but also just um, I, and the animals and the just diversity. And it just, I was really, really wanted to see um, that for myself. And I didn't know anything about Africa then. So I, um, so I moved to Namibia. I was a volunteer for two years in Northern Namibia. For those of you that don't know that region, it's extremely dry. Mm -hmm. um, I lived right on the border of Angola. Um, and I thought when I went that I would go into public health afterwards. I was really interested and passionate about community health, women's health. I worked on a women's development project, again, teaching um, for women who were coming out of apartheid Namibia, which lived under apartheid system for many, many years. But what I quickly realized in living in this community was that so many of the health problems were actually directly related to environmental distress. So everything from the inability to find water that was pulling women away from formal employment because they were spending a lot of time, them and their children, mostly female children, going to fetch water, to fetch firewood that was becoming increasingly scarce just to provide for their families. So I decided not to go to public health school. I came back to New York actually and went to Columbia and studied economics, business development and international relations. Um, and But so that moment, that sort of spark of being in a village in Namibia and you know, my dear friend there, Ria, told me one night, she said, you know, when I was a kid, there were fish in our communities. We had rivers flowing through. All of our crops would survive. It was, it was a bounty, if you will. And now we don't have any of that. And we are changing from corn to millet because we can't grow corn anymore. And she said, this is really impacting the health of, of uh, a lot of the community members where she lived. So that for me was my aha moment. I said, environment is my future. I landed this wonderful job at an organization called Conservation International, uh, where I, was, I had the best job title ever, Wild Harvest Products Manager. And I saw the job advert and I was like, oh, I want to do that. And that was basically helping businesses around the world, small communities, to sell their products to international and domestic markets using nature to save nature for directly impacting their own livelihoods. So, so I worked with The Body Shop, if you guys know, I've heard of The Body Shop, Aveda, many, many companies and helped develop products for, for those companies, it was the best job in the whole world. And then I stayed at Conservation International for 23 years, left there as president when I was um, asked to come and lead the Nature Conservancy just three and a half years ago. Can you talk a little bit about that and 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 in your belief that can actually save nature, externalize value nature in benefit of the local communities. Absolutely, and I think that's the ethos of the Nature Conservancy is exactly that sort of triangle. Because if we are, if we can't go out into the world and say to people, you should save this area. It has to be something that they want to do, that they know that if they lose their watershed, if they lose access to medicines, they lose access to rainfall that comes from the preservation of their local environment, that's going to hurt them, right? But then how do we create the economic opportunities, which has really been my life's work, um, the economic opportunities for for the ability for those communities who are trying to survive, whether they're farmers in Indiana or farmers in, in India, where I just was as well. That, that is so critical. And I think some of the failures of the environmental movement, quite frankly, have been this inability to really speak to humans. They say, hey guys, what do you need? You're part of this ecosystem. We have to meet people where they are, and that means helping people with their basic health needs and their basic economic needs. And that's something that I think our community is getting a lot better at, but I think still think we have a long way to go. And that's, of course, where the private sector comes in. Um, the private sector is 
as you all know in this room, of course, the main driver of growth, of innovation, and certainly of jobs around the world. So working with the private sector, it's even hard to talk about that because it's so big and so diverse. Yeah. Um, maybe we can sort of to frame um, what TNC is trying to achieve. So when you came in, one of the first things you did is, okay, we have to set some goals here, and this is something which we'll speak to this audience. We're gonna have KPIs, we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to this, uh, and we're gonna be able to track it. Now, there was some pretty bolsy goals you set. <laughs> uh, we call them 20, 30 goals. So can you uh, maybe talk a little bit about that? So when I first came in, I said, okay, I turned to my chief strategy officer. I said, what are our priorities? I wanna hear what your priorities are. And he gave me a list of 46. And I said, okay, that is a list. That is not a prioritization. I need to know, I need, first of all, I need a pitch for donors, supporters, and, and others where I can get into an elevator and I can give that pitch without having the elevator to break down for me to finish my pitch. And with 46, I'm never gonna get there. So we sort of stopped and we said, all right, how are we gonna do this in a way that makes sense? So we did it and we have, I'll mention just a few of, of those goals. One, of course, is on climate. And our goal, which of course is embedded in the overall goals of the, of the IPCC report, the, the big um, intergovernmental panel on climate change, is that we will, we will, we as an organization will directly save three gigatons of carbon from into nature, make sure that that doesn't, is not released into the atmosphere every year. Now, three gigatons, anyone know how much that is? Any clue what that is? No, it's about 650 million gas cars every year. Yeah. So it's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the first goal. The second goal is um, around, around our, our main kind of goal as, a, as Nature Conservancy, what we've done historically is land and ocean preservation. So our goal there is an area that is the size of, of India, twice the size of India, excuse me, 650 million hectares of land and, and, and land specifically that we will save. So we have these big, hairy, audacious goals. And what we do is similar to what a company does. Like uh, we have dashboards, we have the data. Models. Yeah. Yes, we've got KPIs. I've got KPIs I share with the board. I mean, we've really tried to professionalize um, our organization in a way that I think we haven't had in the past. Again, where we're all in, in you know, swimming towards the same or rowing towards the same star of one conservancy. And those goals help us get there. I mean, just as many of many companies have these very, very, very clear targets, we have those as well, and that's helping us a lot. We have one GS as well. So I love it. You're talking about great. Um, one of the things which made me excited when um, I was going through the board nomination process is that I saw there was a real opportunity to create um, alignment and incentives using finance. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure anyone who's looked into biodiversity, climate, et cetera, knows back to your point, the, a lot of the work needs to happen in developing markets. And lots of those markets are hampered because they have debt, too much debt, mm -hmm. and reduced ability to actually deal with that. And TNC <clears throat> has really innovated. It's been on the forefront of creating smart financial solutions to align incentives, to externalize value of nature in a way that they can reduce debt burden and then invest in their communities. Mm -hmm. So TNC led uh, Debt for Nature Swap in Belize, in Bahamas, you announced one for Gabon about a month ago now, mm -hmm. yes. So talk a little bit about that and then we'll come on to the board meeting we had in Belize, but just talk about these deals and how you work with governments, institutions, financial institutions like ourselves to put these in place. Sure. So um, <clears throat> I'll mention the third crisis, which is the debt crisis. And most of the countries we work in, in fact, most developing countries are either in debt distress or nearing debt distress, over 60%. So when we say to the country of Belize, for example, where we, Anna and I were um, visiting this summer, and we say to them, well, you know, you, climate crisis is here. You need to be investing in resilience and protecting your farmers and your fishermen. And they say, well, we're spending most of our GDP on just repaying our creditors. So how can we actually do that? 
So this is where this, this na- what we call nature bonds idea, it was actually born in the Seychelles. Um, and the idea is quite simply, can we work together with underwriters like the Development Finance Corporation and refinance, restructure like you would a home mortgage, um, your, your sovereign debt or your, your private debt as well. Um, and so this was kind of a crazy idea. And, you know, I, the board at the time was like, really, we're doing what? We, we're a nonprofit organization, you know, based in the United States, and we're going to be getting into this debt game. And we realized that we were able to use the power of the markets, the power of fixed income investing, and actually do this in a very, very powerful way. So first one was the Seychelles. The, the one that we most recently did was actually in, in, in Gabon. But before that, we did Barbados. Um, and we keep, so we've done four of these transactions. Actions and it's we've refinanced 1.2 billion dollars in sovereign debt, which has unlocked 400 million dollars in money for conservation. And these are countries that have raised their hand and said, We want to protect 30 percent, which is a global goal, 30 percent of our land and ocean by 2030. And then they say, we don't have the money. And we say, well, here is a fantastic opportunity to reduce your debt burden. In the case of Belize, we were able to reduce their debt burden um, by, by 11%. It improved their credit rating. They were on the brink of default. And we created a fantastic instrument for investors where they could have a real impact-driven return for their investment that's commercially available market rate return. And it's working really well, so much so that now we're pushing larger institutions like the World Bank and the IMF to really rethink how they're doing their own lending, to make sure that they're lending in a way that promotes sustainability, that allows governments, if there's a massive storm, for example, like we're seeing all over the world right now, that they can have a break in payments until they can recover for this. And we're making some headway. Like I think with with new leadership at the World Bank in particular, there's a real interest in trying to create new instruments that actually work better for countries that are in debt distress and quite frankly, climate with distress. And um, it's innovative, it's new. We now, um, it's not just us doing this now. Pew Charitable Trust, one of our partner organizations, just did a really big one in Ecuador. Uh, The other thing I have noticed is this sort of business mindset, very practical mindset that TNC has in terms of working. Can you talk a little bit about that? You have a long history working with companies with, you know, with this mindset. How has that relationship change over time, and how do you see it? How, what role can that private-public partnership play yeah. going forward? Yeah, um, we do. In fact, we take um, we we like to think that we take a lot of risk when it comes to working with partners. Um, I think there's you know uh, there's a there's few NGOs that will work with the companies that we work with. Uh, just to be clear, <laughs> um, and we do have robust conversations at the board level about this company. Is this really a company we should be working with? And my position on this is. We have to. I mean, the reality is if we're not engaging in back to to the topic of the week, which is agriculture, if we don't work with the cattle sector and and push them and actually sit at the table and look them in the eye and say, you have to change, but we're going to help you change instead of what a lot of our peers do, which is really important, sit outside and tell them, stop producing your product. We can't do that. They are going to continue. We have to engage with them. We need to work with them practically and find smart solutions. Maybe I'll just mention one that's um, in the fishery space, and that's around tuna. So um, tuna is over-harvested. I won't go into the the, uh, details, but basically we wanted to disrupt the sector. So we did a joint venture. We as the Nature Conservancy created a new company with a government, um, which is called Pacific Island Tuna. And the idea is that we would um, invest in this business with our own fleet and and working with contractors on the ground. 100% of every single boat would have to have a camera on it, would have to measure the amount of bycatch, and would have to very importantly come onto the shore in order, order to offload the product. And we said, okay, well, this is a great idea. We can do this. And very importantly, 100% of the long-term profits will go back to the Republic of Marshall Islands to pay for resilience and community development. Now, then we, so a lot of NGOs come up with these crazy ideas, right? But then we said, we gotta have a buyer. Who's gonna buy this? Who is gonna buy this tuna fish that is unproven, that's not from a traditional supplier, it's a new company, et cetera. 
And believe it or not, our first customer is Walmart. So that is a great example of when Walmart recognized, they came to us and they said, tuna is a disaster. Like we know we gotta fix this industry, but we don't know how to do it. The campaigners are saying just stop. It's an important business for us. Can you help us solve this tricky problem? And that's actually what I love about TNC is we will take some risk. We'll work with companies on those tricky problems and actually help them solve it. Doesn't always work. You know, we, we take risks, right? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And we need to own up to when it doesn't, be honest and, and learn from those mistakes. So that's yeah, what the kind trying. of culture. Yeah, we're yeah. trying. And, yeah. and there's problem solvers. Exactly. I know that TNC has a long history of being nonpartisan, which is important. Um, and I'm just interesting, the, the other thing that you have dri driven though as an agenda is increasing diversity of your workforce. Um, you are a woman and you're leading this organization. What have you done in that area? As the largest environmental organization on planet Earth, that is the Nature Conservancy, we have, to, we have to be the leaders in this. And that means not just who we are as an executive team or as leaders, but also making sure that in everything we do when it comes to conservation, that we're leading with equity, inclusion, and justice. And that's something that we work on every day. And it's not just about the numbers. It's not about the number of people of color you have on your staff. That's really critical. But it's also just about the culture. You know, we look at, we have a, a consensus we're data-driven and we're a science-based organization. We're constantly looking at our data and that includes on this. Are we retaining people that we're hiring the same who come from different yeah. backgrounds? And I, I know that Goldman Sachs is working on that as well. So it's yep. super important for us. On that note, <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. We really appreciate having you here. Thank you for taking the time. And thank you to the audience. So thank you. Thank everyone. you.